Well, having just come through the celebration of the birth of our Lord Jesus, it's so good to be reminded of the mercy seat and the grace that he offers, the fact that he came to uh, demonstrate God's grace and then to apply uh, his life to our sin debts, we could receive his grace. Well, I'm thankful you've joined us uh, today on this first Sunday of the new year. You know, as we look to a to a future that's unknown to us, it's certainly good to apply the wisdom of Solomon that we lean not to our own understanding, but to acknowledge the Lord in all of our ways. Well, on this first Sunday of the new year, as we begin a new year of ministry, I wanted to take some time to be reminded of our purpose as the body of Christ and to make sure that we're on course. You know, it's easy. Uh, I, I love the holidays because there's time to contemplate and think and evaluate, but once we get into the new year, it's very easy to get busy and sometimes get busy with things that are unimportant. And it's easy for our vision um, to become corrupted or, or, or clouded. You know, I have, a, I have a problem in my office here at the church with corruption. Uh, it's not me, it's not anyone on our staff. My problem is with uh, my computer. And uh, Mike Fleischer, many of you don't know Mike because he's kind of a behind the scenes guy. Uh, Mike Fleischer is the guy on staff that we call when we have computer issues. And it seems like I'm always calling Mike saying, hey Mike, my computer's not doing this or my computer's doing that that it shouldn't do. And Mike will frequently come down and, and look it over and figure it out. But typically when I call Mike, uh, the first thing he will ask me is, have you rebooted your computer lately? And come to find out many times those issues that I'm having is because I haven't rebooted that computer, I haven't restarted that computer. And I say that to say this, I think most successful organizations reboot on a regular basis in order to accomplish their mission. Why? Because a reboot gives uh, clarity and focus and attention to the mission that they have. You know, we have a mission statement. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But just because you have a mission statement written, it doesn't guarantee that you'll be successful in accomplishing that mission. You have to stay uh, focused and make a lot of effort to stay focused. You have to be careful to remove any hindrances that will keep you from completing the mission. And I want to say this morning, if there's any organization that should be driven to complete the mission, it should be the church. And the reason is our mission, it's not something we've dreamed up, not some creative idea we've had. Our mission is given to us by our Lord. And so if we're serious about our mission, if we believe that our purpose as the body of Christ is fulfilled in accomplishing our mission, then sometimes it's necessary to reboot. And, and when I talk about a reboot or a restart this morning, please don't hear me say um, that we're horribly off course as a church. In fact, over the next several weeks, you're going to have opportunity to hear some exciting news about ways that we are accomplishing our mission. But we still want to be very uh, proactive and continually be on guard to make sure that we're moving our mission forward uh, as Christ has told us to do. You know, Mike has finally taught me after many, many months, Mike has finally taught me that the best thing for me to do is to reboot my computer every week. If I'll reboot on a regular basis, then some potential issues are resolved before they have the opportunity to develop into a problem. And so that's why we need to take some time and, and start a new year with a reboot, with a, a refocus, if you will, on our mission and values. I want us to be sure that as a church that we're doing what we should be doing, that we're moving our mission forward and not being distracted by things, even, even good things, even good opportunities, even good uh, activities. We don't want to be distracted by anything that doesn't help us achieve our mission. You know, from today forward through this year, we have 359 days left, 8,628 hours. But that's not a guarantee, is it? Individually, we don't know the number of our days. We also don't know when the Lord Jesus might return. And so as we think about the mission that he has for us, I think it'd be good for us to remember his words to his disciples in John 9 and verse 4, when he said to them, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. We're here as a church because we have a work to do. We, we don't simply exist for us. We don't simply exist to, to come together for worship and to study the word for encouragement, for accountability. Those things are all important, but our mission goes well beyond that. Uh, we have a mission that God has given us. And, and when we come together weekly, it's kind of like coming to HQ 
uh, to the headquarters and, and uh, getting charged up, getting resupplied, getting ready to go again. But we can't stay here in headquarters. We have to go out. We have to be on the battlefield if we're going to fulfill our mission. Well, this morning uh, here uh, on campus, everyone has in their hand a copy of our mission statement and our values. I realize you don't have that online, but you can go to our website, gsfbc.org, and then slash values, and they're all uh, listed there. And I'm going to read our mission statement. And, and let me just tell you before I read it, our mission statement is pretty basic. It's, it's actually pretty generic, but there's a reason for that. A lot of churches use different wording. In the past, we've used different wording uh, about our mission, but th the reality is every biblical um, Christ-centered church has the same mission. You can take any biblical Christ-centered church's mission statement and you're gonna find the, the same elements, maybe worded differently, you're gonna find the same elements because the mission comes from our Lord. He has given us a very clear mission in his command. So what is our mission here at Geyer Springs? We've said that a lot over the last couple of years, but if you haven't heard it, if you haven't seen it in a publication, basically our mission very simply is that Geyer Springs exists to glorify God by making disciples who love God and love others. Now, lots of businesses, lots of entities have mission statements, but unlike any other business or entity, as a church, our mission statement must be biblical. So I wanna this morning take some time as we think about that mission statement. We exist to glorify God by making disciples who love God and love others. As we look at that statement, I wanna show you the two passages that that statement is drawn from and why that drives our mission. Uh, we make disciples, it's very clear we make disciples because it was the final command that Jesus gave to the original disciples before he ascended into heaven. If you would, turn to Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew 28, after the resurrection, after his many appearances to the disciples and others, before Jesus ascended back into heaven, he made very clear what his followers were to do. And it's probably a familiar passage for many of you, but Matthew chapter 28 Look with me at verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So our, our objective... It's given by our Lord um, is that we're to make disciples. It wasn't just for those original disciples. That objective has carried down through the ages. That command is one that he's given to all of us. We are to make disciples. We are to lead people to become followers of Christ. And that's pretty simple and straightforward. I think what the church, not just our church, but many churches, what the church has forgotten is that if we're going to truly make disciples as he has commanded us to do, then we have to get outside of these walls. We don't have the luxury of staying in our headquarters, of staying in our comfort zone and calling people to come to us. That's, that's not what he said to do. He said that we are to go. Why we ever thought it was a good idea to expect people to come to us, I don't know. But Jesus clearly said, go. And he said, we're to go and make disciples. What does that mean to make disciples? Well, you can make disciples, you can make a disciple before a person really even comes to faith in Christ. You can disciple someone to faith in Christ. I think of my uh, son-in-law, Brandon, over in the Middle East, and he will often get Muslim men who obviously don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, don't believe that he died to pay the price for our, for our sin, he will get them to read Scripture with him. And they'll begin to see and they'll begin to understand the truth. They're not followers of Christ, but he is discipling them to become a follower of Christ. So you disciple them to faith, and then for those who come to faith, you disciple them in that faith. You help them grow to the point that they are then able to disciple another. And that's what glorifies God. That's what Jesus commanded us to do, to make 
disciples. And so we, we glorify God. Our mission statement is we exist to glorify God. We glorify God by obeying His command. He's glorified when the name of Jesus is lifted up and He's glorified when men and women are drawn to salvation in His name. And I want to tell you that our, our staff team regularly focuses on that mandate. And we focus on it more and more because we want that mandate to pervade all of our ministries. Making disciples is at the forefront of everything that we do because we want to be obedient to the commission given us as a church. And as leaders, we want to lead well in that. We're called to make disciples who make disciples. We're called to multiply followers of Christ. That's why you and I are here today. If someone had not made a disciple who made a disciple who discipled you, you wouldn't be here today. We multiply ourselves as followers of Christ and that's how we get the gospel out. And in the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at and talking about a, a discipleship path, how we specifically here at Geyer Springs move a believer from, from faith, from first coming to faith in Christ, move them to maturity in Christ. So let's think about the second part of the mission statement this morning. We said that we exist to glorify God by making disciples who love God and love others. The second part of that mission statement defines a disciple for us. A disciple loves God and loves others. That's pretty simple, right? Is it scriptural? That's our question. Is that how the Bible describes a disciple? If, if we glorify God by making disciples, and those disciples are people who love God and love others, is that what a disciple should look like? Is that the end product or picture of discipleship? Well, believe it or not, those four words, love God and love others, paint a very comprehensive picture for us. Turn back just a few pages from Matthew chapter 28. Turn back with me to Matthew, Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. And as you're turning there, I want to mention two of Jesus' references to being a disciple. And we'll get back to these. First of all, in John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus said, talking to the disciples, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And then over in John chapter 14 and verse 15, Jesus told the disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You know, there are a lot of commandments in scripture. So how can we possibly know if we're uh, on track and if we're being obedient? Well, Jesus answers that question here in Matthew 22, because in Matthew 22, we have a very concise picture of a disciple. Look with me in Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great comm greatest commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and all the prophets. Now, just some quick background of what's happening here in Matthew 22. You remember that the religious leaders uh, hated Jesus. They were incredibly jealous of him. He, he continually was pointing out the hypocrisy of their religious practice. He had bigger crowds. He was much more popular than they were. He taught with authority. When, when Jesus taught, people recognized this guy has authority. There is, there is power in his teaching. And then his miracles validated his message and validated that he was indeed the Son of God. And so the, the religious leaders hated Jesus. They, they wanted to kill him, but he was so popular with the people, they were afraid that they were not going to be able to do that. So what they would do is whenever Jesus was, ha had a crowd gathered around him, they would try to discredit him. Uh, two previous times here in Matthew 22, they tried to ask him trick questions, one about um, um, giving and, and one about uh, marriage during the resurrection. They were always trying to trick or, or, or trap him with a question. So this third question here was about the law itself. You see, the religious leaders loved laws. Um, they loved laws more than they loved God. They loved laws more than they loved people. And they loved to talk about, the reason they loved laws is they loved to talk about how righteous they were in, in all the laws that they kept. You know, in the Decalogue, in the, the Ten Commandments, 
Um, if you go back to the, the Hebrew, don't count these in English, it's not gonna match up to what I'm about to tell you, but if you go to the Hebrew and you count uh, all of the letters in the Ten Commandments, there are 613 letters in the Ten Commandments. And so the Pharisees, the religious leaders, came up with 613 corresponding laws. There were 365 negative laws, one for each day of the year, and then they had another 248, uh, we'll call them more positive or affirmative laws that related to each part of the body. So they had 613 laws on top of the Ten Commandments. Some of the laws they would call light. Um, in other words, a light law was kind of semi-optional whether or not you kept it. But then there were some, some heavy laws which were binding. And so with all these laws in mind, they're trying to trap Jesus here by getting him to say that one law is more important than another. And even though they're trying to trick or trap Jesus, it's really a pretty good question. If you have all these different laws, it's going to be difficult. How, how could you possibly keep up or even remember 613 different laws? How could you possibly remember whether or not you had obeyed every one of those laws? Wouldn't it be great if there was just a simple summary to the law? So this is a great question because we're about to get a summary to the law. What's really important when it comes to the law? So this expert in the law gives us an opportunity to get a clear picture of discipleship. What does it truly mean to follow Jesus. Remember, I quoted for you a few minutes ago from John, Jesus has said, my disciples abide in my word. Jesus has said, those who love me keep my commands. Now he tells us exactly how to do that. Look back again where we just read in Matthew 22, look back at verse 37. What's the most important law? He says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Now, Jesus hasn't changed the law. Jesus hasn't created some new law. He's not saying that the law that God's already laid down in Scripture is not important or doesn't matter any longer. He's not saying you can throw out the, the, the uh, Ten Commandments. It's not what he's saying at all. In fact, he's actually quoting here in verse 37 a Scripture that was very familiar to God's people. What he says in verse 37 comes from Deuteronomy 6, 5, where the people were told, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. It's not a new law. Now let me go back to our mission statement for just a quick minute. We exist to glorify God by making disciples, first thing, who love God. Well, what does it look like to love God? How do we know if we are truly loving God? The Hebrew word there in Deuteronomy 6 for love God, the Hebrew word for love is ahav. And it's more than just the way we think of love. It's more than an emotional attachment or, or, or affection. That Hebrew word ahav speaks to intense loyalty and intense dedication. It literally means to love God more than anything or anyone else. It's not a love that's just felt. It, it, it denotes commitment and dedication and, and action. And you'll notice Jesus is very specific. He doesn't just say you need to love God with your whole being or love God with all you've got. He specified exactly what that means. First he said you love God with all your heart. Well, the heart, in, to the Hebrews, the heart represented the very core of their identity. The, the heart was what determined their, their thoughts and their words and their actions. Think about Jesus saying in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 18, what comes from the mouth proceeds from the heart. The words that come out of your mouth are because of what is in your heart, who you really are. I think of the words of Solomon in, in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 where he says, you need to watch over your heart because your life flows from your heart. Uh, a true disciple, one who truly loves God, is committed to the, the core. That's what the heart represents, committed to the core, completely surrendered so much so that even his thoughts and even his speech and every action, all that comes from him reflects his love for God. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Secondly, he said, love God with all your soul. And that really refers more to the emotions. You know, we should have an emotional love for God. It's got to be more than that, but there should be an emotional love for God. What do, I mean, what do I mean by that? We should, when we consider all that God has done for us, it should move us emotionally. 
And I want to tell you, one of the places we should see that most often is in worship. You know, if we're in, in worship and we're, we're singing praise to God and singing about God and how great He is, that should move us. If I'm able to just stand there stoically and just mouth the words as I sing, then I'm not loving God with all my soul. I'm not really being moved. I'm not saying that worship needs to become a big emotional thing. I know in some churches the, the emotions seem to override everything else, but I am saying when we truly worship and when we're truly focused on God, whether it's in corporate worship or private individual worship, we should be overwhelmed with gratitude because of all that he's done for us. So Jesus said, love the Lord your God with, the, with all your heart, with all your soul. And then he says, with all your mind. Now, if you know Deuteronomy 6.5 well, you know that the word in Deuteronomy 6.5 is not mind, but might. Now, Jesus is not misquoting here when he uses the word mind in, instead of might. Might has to do with, with uh, intention and, and will. When you think about your might, your intention, and your, your will to, to get it done. And, and the same thing is true of mind. Think about how often you've said or heard someone say, well, he really put his mind to accomplishing that, to getting that done. It's, it's kind of interchangeable, mind and, and might. It's, it's the strength in us that we put into action and put into service. And so Jesus says, when you love God, you love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. What is he talking about? He's talking about a, a balanced love. It's a love that, that's intellectual, it's understandable, it's a love that has feelings, it's a love that is willing and, and is serving. And, and what God was saying to his people in Deuteronomy and what Jesus is saying and communicating here is that God is not looking for people who, who go through the motions. God's not looking for people who can perform the religious rituals and give the appearance of loving him. Just because you show up at church, just because you go to a Bible study, just because you talk about, about Christian things, that doesn't mean that you're really loving God. He's not looking for people who do all these things outwardly. It's not about what's on outside, on the outside, but it's what is genuine inside. And that's something we should consider when we gather for worship each week. Even if you're worshiping online, you're not worshiping here on campus with us. When we worship, when we gather together, we need to be fully engaged. If you're on online and you've got a lot of other distractions going on, you're not able to be fully engaged. When we worship, we should be fully engaged because genuine worship, genuine love for God includes also our, our thoughts and, and our attitudes, not just our words and our actions, not just what we're doing outwardly, but the fact that we're connected with our thoughts and, and with our attitudes. You know, the prophet Isaiah, God was very frustrated with his people at this point in their history. And the prophet Isaiah says to them, listen, God doesn't want your lip service. God doesn't care that you fulfill all the religious rules and rituals of worship because those things are all made up by men. Those are, those are rules that religious leaders have added. God doesn't care about that. He doesn't want worship. He doesn't want hypocritical acts of love. Don't, don't come to him, don't come to worship him and act like you love him when you're not living for him. Your heart is far from him. Isaiah said, God's tired of your lip service. God's tired of your worship because your heart is far from him. You know, we need to consider, we need to remember that God loved us with his whole being. He gave everything in order to save us. I want you to think about that for just a minute. If God's only blessing in your life was the fact that he brought you to faith, that he brought you to salvation in Christ, if that was the only blessing ever he gave and you never received another blessing from him, it's enough. It is enough that he chose to save us, to bless us in that way. And you can imagine if you were God and you gave everything to save your creation, you would expect a whole lot more than some, some half-hearted love in return. Well, a true disciple loves God completely, desires to, to be with him, to spend time with him. A true disciple trusts him completely, and a true disciple um, desires to obey. Now, do we as disciples, do we sin and do we disobey? Absolutely. We're human. 
Uh, we're made from the dust. We have feet of clay. But when a true disciple sins or, or disobeys, because of his love for the Father, he will re- that disciple will repent, and that disciple will uh, pursue a continuing love relationship with God with his whole being, no matter what. Well, our mission statement says that we glorify God by making disciples who love God, and then the second part of that, disciples who love others. And what did Jesus say? When he was asked what's the greatest commandment, he said, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and the second is like it. The second greatest commandment is like it. And what was that second commandment? It was to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, what does it mean the second is like it? It means it's, it's like the first in that it follows the same track, or it's like the first because it has the same kind of nature as the first commandment. What does that mean? Well, we're to be as devoted to the second commandment as we are to the first. Not just give a passing acknowledgement to the fact that we should love our neighbor, but to be fully committed. Just as we're fully committed to love God, we're fully committed to love our neighbor. Jesus said you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you love God rightly, that should not be too difficult. Because when you love God rightly, when you're connected to the heart of God, his heart becomes your heart. His concern for others becomes your concern for others. The, the problem for most of us is we are basically um, lovers of self. We're concerned about our own comfort, our own convenience. We're concerned about our needs. We're working toward goals in our life, and we don't want anything to get in the way or interrupt that or, or take time from that. But when we do as Jesus said, when we truly love others, it means that we will look to meet the needs of others just as readily, just as quickly, and just as completely as we look to meet our own needs. Probably the greatest uh, explanation or picture of how to love others comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul writes these words in verses 3 and 4 that really help us understand what it means to love others. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. And so, there you have it. Being a Christ follower, being a a disciple of Christ isn't all that complicated. You you don't have to know 613 different laws because Jesus said all of the law hangs on these two commands, love God and love men. Think about the Ten Commandments. If you go back and look at the Ten Commandments, you'll see that the Ten Commandments hang on the, the law that Jesus said, love God, love men. The first four of the Ten Commandments reflect our love for God. It tells us what our actions should be out of our love for Him. And then the next six reflect our love for man. If you love God, you obey His commandments. If you love men, you, you meet their needs. Every other um, commandment, every other law given in Scripture just explains how to do those two things. In the New Testament, where we're told to be kind and be tender-hearted toward one another, forgiving one another, it just exemplifies or or sheds light on what it means to love others. Every command in Scripture is covered by what Jesus said to love God and love others. So that's who a disciple is. A disciple is someone who loves God wholeheartedly and loves others unselfishly. And our reminder on this first Sunday of 2024 is that that is our mission. Our mission is to glorify God by making disciples who love God and love others. And here's the reality. If we're going to achieve that mission as a body, if we're going to achieve that mission corporately, then we have to first ourselves individually be disciples who love God and love others. We, we can't achieve it as a church if every individual is not working toward that same mission. Now, before we wrap up, wrap up this morning, I want to cover one other thing very quickly. Um, and, and again, you don't have a copy in hand, but it is online. I want to share with you um, the values that for us are, are foundational. They undergird our mission and they drive our mission. There are six values that we have. And if you're, if you're new to Geyer Springs or if you're new to our online audience, 
Um, hopefully these values will help you understand why we do what we do and how we do what we do as a church body. If you've been connected to Geyer Springs for quite some time, maybe for, for several years, um, I would hope that none of these values are unknown to you, that you've seen these values uh, demonstrated in our ministry here. Now, I won't have time under each value, and as you go online and look, you'll see this under each value are the scriptural references from where we have drawn this value. I won't have time to go through all those references, but I hope you'll take some time to look those up. So here are six biblical values that undergird our mission, our work that we do as a church. Value number one, and this is, takes precedence over every other value, and that is this, biblical authority. And if you've been around here long at all, you know that we believe in biblical authority. The, the Bible, God's word is the ultimate authority for everything we do, how we think, how we live, how we operate. I'll illustrate it this way very simply. In our Discover class, when new people come to Geyer Springs and, and want to join, as they go through our Discover class, um, we always cover the issue of salvation and baptism. That's the first thing we do. We want to be sure that someone is not just joining our church, but that they have a relationship with Christ. And knowing there are people from different backgrounds, when we come to baptism, I make this statement to them. We baptize by immersion, not because we're a Baptist church. We baptize by immersion because that's what the New Testament teaches. And I take a moment and say to them, listen, just so you're clear, however we operate here, whatever we do here, we do not because we're a Baptist church, but because we are a New Testament church. Jesus established the church in the New Testament. And as we look at how he established the church and look at how the church operated, that's what we want to do. We believe in biblical authority and we operate by biblical authority here. Our second value, we call gospel centrality. What does that mean? It means the gospel is central to everything we do. Every event, every activity, we are looking for opportunity to present the gospel. Gospel centrality means that we believe the gospel is for everyone, every race, every nation, every tongue, every tribe, every people. And the gospel centrality moves us outside of these walls. It moves us to go to other places and make sure that the gospel message is heard. Our third value is prayerful dependence. And I'll be very honest with you, we're much weaker there than I wish we were. We know that we are dependent on God. We know that all of our plans and, and all of the things that we dream up and all the ministries that we'd like to do are not gonna work apart from prayerful dependence on the Lord. And so we're working as a church, striving to be more prayerfully dependent, recognizing that the power to the ministry that God has given us to do is found in prayer. Our fourth value is transformational discipleship. Now I've already talked a lot about discipleship this morning, but I just wanna be clear that our value, when I say transformational discipleship, our value is that every person that God sends our way to Geyer Springs, we are helping grow and mature in their faith and seeing their lives transform by the work of discipleship in them. Our, our goal is to make disciples who make disciples, to multiply ourselves as followers of Christ. Fifth value goes right along with transformational discipleship, and that is authentic relationships. God has made us for relationship, first of all with him, and then secondly with each other. No one should try to live the Christian life uh, on their own, or as a lone ranger, we might say, but we need to be connected relationally in the body of Christ. And so it's a value to us that we move toward authentic relationships, not only in, in our relationship with the Father through our worship together, but also in our relationship to one another through small groups and times that we spend together knowing each other more deeply and helping each other through encouragement and through accountability. And finally, our final value, we simply call kingdom cooperation. Listen, we know we can't do all of the work of the kingdom. We, we have to align ourselves and work with others who are like-minded theologically and doctrinally. Uh, you know that we have a lot of community partners. We talk a lot about the different community partners that we work with, people that are, are doing the gospel work in places where we wouldn't be successful, but where we can send resources and we can send uh, help, not only financially, but, but people as well. Kingdom cooperation is a very high value to us. And in fact, in just a few weeks, we're gonna be telling you about a very new 
kingdom cooperation project that is launching people out with the gospel message. We can't reach everyone here in our walls. We've, we've got to get involved outside of our walls and we can't do all of that on our own. So kingdom cooperation is a high value to us because God has called us to make disciples. And we're going to do that every way we can with every opportunity he puts before us. Would you bow with me for just a moment this morning, right where you are, and let's take just a moment and think about what we've learned from the Word of God this morning and think about where we are in relation to that. Jesus has called us individually and as the body of Christ to make disciples. Disciples who love God and love others. And you know, even if you're someone who can't get out much, maybe health doesn't allow you to get out much, you still have a part in that. You can pray for this church. You can pray for people you know who need to know Christ. You can pray for believers you know who have grown distant, that need to have their passion for the Lord reignited. You can speak the gospel when you have opportunity, when you encounter people, maybe someone making a delivery to your home or the mailman or I, I don't know, whoever God brings across your path, you always have opportunity to speak forth the truth of the gospel. You are part of the body of Christ we call Geyer Springs Baptist Church. And so you're part of the mission of making disciples, glorify God by making disciples who love God and love others. Father, I pray you would take the words we've looked at from your scripture this morning. And God, because you, your, your Holy Spirit indwells every believer, your spirit can take the truth and apply it at the point of need. So I ask that you would do that for every member of our body. And God, I pray that 2024 would be a year that we move the ball down the field in a significant way when it comes to obeying the mission and the command that you've given us. And I thank you for that and trust you for that in Jesus' name, amen.